Mwekhamar, Shwe Area Crossing. Artenia Shinla, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of Hawk in the Crossroads. I know we've been gone for a while, but today we're going to be talking about starships and space travel in the Avalon Cluster. I'm just going to read a little anecdote for you. John stood at the helm of the Dauntless as it sailed soundless through the star winds, a great unseen motion of gravity and sunlight from one of the great central stars that provided the currents for the ship to catch with its great solar sails. Even now, the Dauntless was shifting through the winds as if it were being carried on toward Elik from a trade run in the Masadi sector. Jean smiled as the great Place Grasse windows provided him a safe sight of what was in front of him. A deep hum from the internal AFD drive could be which power the ship thrust in special anchors continued as the ship was sailing in a mode while moving at high speeds. The Dauntless was almost looked like a galleon from an old legends of the high seas of Ellis. It was a shaped in a more smooth and square fashion, a raised section of the ridge set upon a high, narrow, long hull that then extended into a point. Gun ports sat along the side to provide defense in the case of attack by corsairs, and long plastic cables connected to four great sails that spread out in front in a large square pattern on either side of the front hull. The Adventures of Jean Starwalker, the Grand Star Archive. All right, everybody. The thing to talk about today is that the starships of Land of the Stars are quite uni- unique in their design and their influence. They are specifically solar sails, so even um, anything that travels between different systems or in a large area requires solar sails, otherwise they're restricted to fusion speeds, and we'll be talking about that in a little bit. Life in the Sea of Stars is filled with danger, adventure, and is constantly a gamble. High stakes are always applied in the vacuum of the sea, as it is far unlike anything Faerun, Anodorik, or even a rashic kind could fathom. Only the ship born in the void can... seem to be at home in the depths of the endless black abyss that is the Sea of Stars. Those that ply the sea are after called astral liners, taken from the old Ellis to mean one who plies the stars, literally. The, starship of Ab- the starships of Apollon come in various designs and general configurations. The configuration design of ships across the out- known space of the Avalon Cluster are quite varied and differentiated as a result of cultural diversity. But over time, three successive imperial dials of Prum, even the most stubborn, can come to understand the advantage of standardization. It becomes a za- standardization undertaken by a small but powerful guild known as the Artificer's Guild, who are the most skilled shipbuilders of the known stars. The guild itself is not as powerful as the Rites, or even the Meisters, but still has power to define the basic starship design through the Avalon Cluster. Even the Guagara, for reasons unknown, adhere to these designs. Ship classifications come based upon size, their speed, and also their application. The first is the transport craft. Transport include large cartano cargo ships, often called NARS or COGS. They can carry large loads of material with minimum crew. Small transports also include a smaller large shuttles and sometimes long transport liners. Strike craft include corvettes and fighters in the definition of strike craft specifically. They refer to small, quick ships that can only travel for a limited space and often crew a small crew of no more than 20. Gunships are the largest of the strike craft and are often used as heavy escort while corvettes and fighters are small attack craft. Capital craft are the next and they are often restricted to definitions such as destroyers, frigates, and even the larger versions known as the ships of the line or even carriers. Most of these ships uh, are also allowed for the transport of Chevalier chariot vehicles and the carrier char- Chevaliers themselves. Ship identification specifically is controlled via something known as the Imperial Identification Serial System or the IISS or IS, which uh, expands to a large scale near independent ships and crafts such as transport and capital and even Chevaliers. The system was imposed by the Emperor of the Archer Dynasty as a means of tracking the powerful weaponized vehicles across the triad. The general makeup of ships is a little complicated, but we're going to quickly do a bit of an overview, and then we're going to jump and discuss propulsion. Starships in Avalon are often come in various many shapes, but they almost always have a primary bridge, where the bridge officers can maintain strict attention when traveling through space. The main sections often include the bridge, as mentioned before, is often located the upper stern of the ship's upper hull or near the bow. General specifications include for a place where central officers to sit, usually the captain, and the bridge often includes a tactical station to direct the ship's weapons and a helm to steer the ship in general. 
Engineering. Homes to the central AFD power systems and the ship's central core, computer core. Includes an isolated area for the center, central cluster of AN flux drives that then are aligned to form into the central core or heart that can be directed via specialized controls. Command core. The command core is the second major aspect of the engineering that forms the neural system of the, sh of the ship itself. Generally, terminals that can access the core are found throughout the ship at regular intervals. The medical bay is a place for medical supplies and equipment, and the medical bay is often found within the ship in space far away from the engineering in case a containment leak occurs with the AFD core. The galley is a place made up generally of cooking of a ship's kitchen <laughs> and the mess hall, and it's sometimes near the main cargo bay so the food can be accessed quickly. The kitchen itself possesses limited cooking arrays, power crate, but the core must be focused on life support and maintain the artificial gravity of the ship itself. Ship's quarters, these are or sleeping quarters, are set aside for suites for crew and passengers, are mostly designed with a bunk up to three to crewmen, and a place for minor effects and clothing. The carrier hold is a section found on carriers and ships aligned to store shuttles, surface to air gunships, and even strike craft. The armor is the prime location of the ship's onboard arsenal and where crew may fall back in case of a boarding party, often defended by heavy shielding and multiple system firewalls. Corvettes and fighters often do not contain the majority of the sections above. They often contain a, a cockpit, an AFD core, and a second area for storage. Smaller frigates, such as gunships, often contain all the above, will combine the command core and the bridge into one section, with the engineering remaining separate, though that's not always the case. Let's talk a little bit about the general... Um, aspects of ship technology. These are a little bit complicated, so we're going to kind of jump into it. The thing to quickly note is that most, if not all, ships are maintained by a VI or even a Talos, and this is overseen by the head systems officer, or SO. Now, primary means of traveling through space is split between the solar sails and the AFD thrusters, which allow maneuvering. When not riding the star winds, the solar sails can be used to catch gravitational eddies for swift turns and for minor speed adjustments. However, most non-wind-based travel is centered on the usage of central AFD engines which allow for the basic speed known as fusion shift. This often allows for travel between inner and outer orbit in a relatively manageable time. It cannot be used in atmospheric situations. Remember that people that bring your ship into the atmosphere is not the best idea. Fusion shift cannot be used during solar shift or when the solar sails are unfurled and used to travel across the system or inter-system travel. The strain placed on the sails by the AFD central rockets would cause a mass concentration of strain to the plus cabling that holds the sails in place. Most, star most transport and capital craft forces access the solar sails with only corvettes being able to use them for strike craft. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about speed and travel time. There's different currents and gravitational... Um, eddies and also light that is found throughout the sea of stars. The engine speeds present the ship is also dependent upon the type of general model. Different models and different classes have different speed limits. The fastest often being a um for example, the, uh, the Clipper ship is one of the fastest. The Artificers Guild organizes these various speeds into a general scheme named for one of its preeminent follow uh, preeminent founders, Truth Seeker Alessia, the member of the Dragon Cabal who helps standardize the basic scale is being known as the furling factor. It was named because of this can, one can increase speed by unfurling or opening the solar sails greater as a means of catching more starlight. The scale itself is from a factor of 1, 20, 2500 clicks per second or KPS, a click being roughly a kilometer for those of you who want a translation, and it increases by 250 KPS for, a, for, multi, for multiplication to a maximum of 10 kps, basically 500 kph. Smaller speeds can be achieved via fusion shifts, and these are often called simply fusion speed, and they're marked between 1000 kps to a minimum amount to a minimum uh, amount of a quarter. So basically you can go as fast as 200 um, 2000 kph when just in fusion. And we did this based upon a notion that you can actually estimate, we're going to quickly note this, um, a lot of fantasy websites or other websites will have kind of travel times. We wanted to make it so people could calculate this themselves, give an idea. Um, to kind of give you guys an idea, um, on an average, most ships only travel between a factor of 5 and 7. That's an average size. 
Um, travel across the entirety of the triad is about 52 days. This can be modulated by p the pending speed and the other problems that might be in transit. Most ships predict the space of time by calculating the base distance of the parsec and then dividing it into their average KPH or KPS. A parsec is roughly, I believe, a billion clicks. So, yeah, we I got a rough estimation to how big the uh, our solar system was, not based in AUs, and we use this as a means to calculate, and there is a way to actually figure that out. And you can actually figure out how long it is. We actually know the travel, how, you know, how, and we even have an example here for those of you who want to know the super specifics. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the construction of the hull. I'm going to talk about this because it's quite, it's quite important for those of you who really want to know about starships in general. The general construction of a hull is dependent upon its major configuration in the form of tanks. Most combat vessels, especially capital craft, are shaped in an elongated style or either centric, cylindrical or arrowhead or arrowhead in shape. There is it fastened to the long long plastic cables hold the socios are often called masses from the old ceiling. Ships of old, the areas for masts are generally midway along the four points of the hull. These long cables extend outward from the mast before the bow of the ship and the mast can extend and retract. The mooring cables as the solar sails is necessary, allowing the ship to unfurl and lash the sails as necessary. The hull and built of the ship come in a series of layers based upon their purpose. This includes primary layers of the sign, the defensive armor that is found in the exterior of the ship, the outer armor that is home to the maintenance corridors, and the inner hull used for habitation and work and work sections. Only the inner hull is pressurized with atmosphere at all times. The outer hull is shielded from stellar radiation, but remains pressurized as a means to con unpressurize room as a means to conserve power. Sections of the outer hull are always also uh, are always separately and sealed hermetically behind um, lockdown doors and air and airlocks to prevent any form of foreign atmosphere, toxic irritants, or other foreign elements into the ship itself. Sections of the hull are out generally lo are, have localized airlocks found at regular intervals across the decks. Within the inner hull, occupants are able to travel in lifts that go straight to the, to the height of the ship itself or even the length, depending upon how the ship is organized. Most rooms are sealed with airtight doors that can be used to control ruptures in the hull itself or if there's, or to isolate intruders. Most consoles and terminals with the, star, the Starship are flat plaz glass touchscreens, which can be loaded a series of different programs. The central display for the ship itself is found via hollow holographic image, often projected from the center of, of, from the bridge, and it can be used to view the long-range sensors. The VI, or the ship's intelligence, then often communicates with the crew via displays or selective hollow projectors. Most screens are reinforced with plastic steel plate, which makes them hard to break or shatter unless hit by a massive con concentrated impact or a large concussive impact. Some displays can be activated and controlled via motion if motion cameras are installed in them. Not all of them. It really depends on how up-to-date the ship is. Active life support system of the vessel is a mixture of water and air control systems along with heat. Most life, supports be life support begins the shielding building on the inner plating, which allows the controlled press atmosphere within the ship itself. The plating is, uh, is, in addition to controlling the heat, also protects those inside from radiation and the vacuum of space. These multiple fail-safes installed upon ships that allow the ship to instantly shutter a broken bulkhead or deal with intense ruptures of the hull. Life support in general runs on a recycled air that often has a distinctly sanitized smell to it. The water too is recycled, means it generally ta it's generally tasteless, if not finishing a slight hint of metallic aftertaste because of the process of scrubbing and removing all pollutants, aka it removes your shit. One problem, however, is life support is general limitations. Air must eventually be cleaned out of the machines to replenish levels of oxygen, and water itself still contain is considered an expensive commodity, especially in space. Many starships who travel the star winds and long journeys often incorporate plants, hydroponic gardens, and other organic means to maintain res resources. It is not at all har hard to buy frozen water sources or chemicals to produce water from traveling mer merchants through the marshes or to mine it from stray asteroids or planetoids. It's one way how um, starborn actually get their water. They will go out, locate a water source out in space, and they will mine it. That's actually quite common for most clusters or even just simple space stations. Offensive systems. This is a very long write-up. <laughs> it's one reason why we have an entire episode just dedicated to starships. And then we'll do one more tomorrow where, um, in a few weeks where we talk about the different kind of starships and give some examples of what you're going to be facing. Weapon systems for a ship are generally controlled by the tactical station on the bridge or within the the primary cockpit of the ship. Sometimes the secondary turrets will have aiming systems or even separate tactical systems. <coughs> Uh, station. Sorry about this. A little bit sick. 
These ex exist as a means of allowing for pivoting control and for secondary tracking. Secondary turrets exist not for attack purposes primary, but defensive. Basically, they're point, de the point defense turrets. They are needed to take on outcoming ro rockets and take down smaller quick craft and often or destroy errant objects. So if you're being assaulted by meteors, they might be used to destroy space dust or even just explode a meteor shower or take out rockets that are attacking. And again, sorry for the yawn, but we're moving forward. Main guns are found within gun ports too as a means of shielding them during hits and from external threats because you don't want a gun being damaged by space debris when you're in travel, so you don't leave them open. Constant threat bombardment from space speed generally damages internal systems. Weapon types for ships for cans include rail guns, which can shoot a variety of projectiles, explosive, corrosive, scatter bombs, and heavy armor pen penetration. Some ships of greater power output are also able to use beam weapons, which use a large blast of focus heated laser light. These weapons, however, require significant cooling and may get fired in lengthy intervals. So basically, if you have a laser on your ship, expect it to take a while to fire. Other expensive systems available to ships is that of torpedo bays and primary surface and surf surface missile systems. They're often used for small moving targets or to strike at atmospheric targets. Sur surf surface missiles are shielded for re-entry and can take more damage. And sometimes used to strike targets which are near heated areas or may need or are using explosive shielding. Let's talk a bit about the defensive systems. The primary defense of a ship is its armor. Armor is located through the layers and the outer shield is a mixture of these various different layers. The animus layer is generally made of a fine nano lacquer film which can be found over time recoup damage to the ship itself. This is often known as the plasmatic armor and often requires raw materials for the knives to build, build, rebuild lost sections. Yes, they can rebuild lost sections, but it takes time. These are found in specially expelled packages launched via special pipelines located in the outer hull. The plasmatic armor then uses them to to being the most basic of repair so they can seal up things. Underneath the plasmatic armor is a thick layer of gray auto which can absorb and displace energy of incoming impacts. Under that is in a thick layer of reinforced compartments with radiation shielding and interlocking caissons which can be flooded with coolant in case of a fire or deal with ruptures in space. Any sort of hull breach is automatically sealed by the plasmatic armor if possible but in extreme cases of duress the nanites may make up a a FAS film may fail and secondary breach systems to release the fine mist, which then co coagulate near the rupture in the hull itself. Basically, if you suddenly have a, a hull breach on your ship, hopefully the coagulation system will kick in and it will basically seal it automatically. This is not always the case, and you may have people killed. Weapon defense is generally provided by series of small turrets, aka the point of force turrets, first line usually incoming projecti projectiles and torpedoes, then small cans release a small explosive counter charge, and point defense shots and concussive mines that can use to to and can be used to decoy enemy volleys. Anti-hacking measures are pretty straightforward. Most ship internal command core are defended by a series of programs and tend to be and prevent hacking via external sources. These programs at times can be quite complicated and often spiral out subroutines that confuse and even harm hackers who might attempt to break the ship's firewall system. Okay. Communication and sensors. Most, if not all, Avalonic ships all possess a sensor array which can do multiple things such as detect radiation levels, locate incoming ships with a set sphere of detection, long range is usually a few hundred clicks, or no more than that, short range is under a hundred clicks. Sensors can be brought up on displays across the ship with long range only being available in the bridge or engineering. Most sensor arrays are found in small dishes which can retract from the outer hull into sensor ports. When retracted, they lose all long range ability. And communication from a ship is, is conducted using virtual networks over the sysnet and having information transferred using narrow band laser emissions. Because the ship is constantly in move, there's considered light time outside of the central network of the ship, simply lovingly called the schlag or ship lag. Schlag. Oh my god, everything is schlagging. I hope you guys like that. Internal ship systems are often seen by the VI or Talos and are generally charged with managing a series of communications required to coordinate efforts across the ship and others. In many cases, these internal communications are done in basic chat system or sometimes in full VR interactions via the sysnet or the shipnet if you want to get specific. Let's talk a little bit about navigational technology. The navigation of a starship is relied upon gravimetric sensors, which are able to sense long-range changes in gravity wells across the, a the Avalon cluster. Most of these sensors allow a system to sense the movement of starlight across the system and thus ride the storm winds themselves. 
more complicated sensors include the ones that track the movements of various spatial bodies. Other than primary viewer, a major means of navigation was the proximity sensor, a display that allows the pilot of the ship to detect down to the centimeter, the centimeter, or how close the ship is in general to object or distortion. All right. Years ago, the entirety of the triad was mapped by the likes of Desmond Storwalker and his des and his descendants. So the way how this really works, and we're talking a little bit more about navigational technology, um, is that there's a series of buoys spread throughout um, the actual uh, system, and these are uh, actually a way on how the entire system is matched. The thing to note is that these buoys and relays can be moved, and there's actually colonists known as wreckers which trick people into hating debris so they can um, actually salvage the dead ship. Um, and it's kind of pretty much the get one reason why the Artificers Guild actually controls the spatial positioning network or the SPN. So as we noted, all ships have a kind of a locator and they actually all position themselves and this is one way of how you can figure out where you are. It, you not only tell the gravimetric wells, but also your ship is um, kind of connected to the sysnet and the positioning net, and it kind of pings these different uh, local arrays and other means, and it kind of gets a location plus with the location of gravity wells of the stars and the planets themselves. This allows the navigators of CS charts to the trace their path in greater span space, but the chart where they may be. Even the drift colonies of the reaches have commonality of orbit to some relative space, and thus even when a lost, and even a good astrolean can find their way. Headings in general are marked by the parsect and then the closest buoy in the area. Generally, generally a cubular section of space known as a quadrant and are often multiple spatial bodies and features localized to it. Last but not least, we're going to talk about artificial gravity before we finish up for tonight. The artificial gravity system are sometimes simply known as the gravitas field and are generated as a strange reaction between the AFD core and the inertial brakes found across the ship itself. The initial brakes or anchor are what allows the ship to remain in place at a given time. It's kind of like a system of basically um, a few, uh, it's a mixture of gravitational brakes and also thrusters that keep the ship pinned in one spot. It's not perfect, but it's, uh, it's how you get this gravitas field. It's the interaction between the two different um, technologies. Both these, these technologies create a lesser form of gravity than that of the world's, about three quarters normal gravity, and can be found in the inner hull and the outer de and the uh, notice that outer decks lack gravity. The system itself generally operates quite well under most circumstances, but can face some problems for in specific cases. In the cases of quick sun turns or increased speed, hard burn when thrusters are activated to increase speed built to add to the solar sails. When power gets too low or secondary systems for power are engaged, artificial and gravity will in general disengage, meaning that hand grips and restraints of belt they can be attached to the ports and links to the ship. If not restrained, an individual can be hurt during drastic changes in the course or drastic changes in speed. Most problems in gravity, such as exiting atmosphere or gravity wells, along with changes in course, are dealt with by inertial brakes. These brakes themselves decrease the shifts in gravity, gravity to a manageable level. So basically, not only do they keep the ship in place, but in most of the cases, if you fly up and out of a gravity well, it decreases the difference so you don't get sick or you don't deal with the problems of the gravity well itself. Now, everybody, thank you for listening tonight. Um, we'll see you next week. I apologize for the long interval. It's been very busy. But as the Amazons say, Fehen Shush, have a good time. This was your host, Padre Gosi, a.k.a. Shadow Sin. Goodbye.